let me give a quick uh, intro. So we're interested in this problem because we uh, because of our causality project. But anyways, uh, we're writing uh, Dockerized, kind of uh, replicating uh, in part what the Brainforge has done, we're writing uh, Dockerized pre-processing for fMRI and MEG if we want multi model and we want uh, eventual causal fusion. But um, we're replicating conceptual steps, but doing it um, uh, slightly differently, uh, doing different processing that Brad has done in Brain Forge. Uh, still want to do group ICA. And uh, our next step is group ICA. All of MRI is done by Joanne. And so she's looking into doing group ICA as her next step. But after that, how do we select good components? and we're looking at the ways to select the components, which um, someone has done one or possible approaches. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm a little nervous. Um, it's my first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's given a uh, much worse than I'm sure. I think we're going to talk about it. Anybody here? Uh, Wants to look at it or has any uh, questions or discussion points, so feel free to come around. Um, but I'm discussing the paper called An Approach to Automatically Label and Order Brain Activity Component Now. So I just want to begin the discussion with um, the problem of noise and fMRI data. So uh, meaningful changes are, are oftentimes small and hidden in bold signal um, because. Compared to the total um, intensity of the MR signal, the bold signal changes is relatively small. And also, too, if you're looking at um, just the changes in bold signal versus the change in, of the total signal, it's typically pretty small um, because there's changes um, in areas outside of the brain and maybe some other kinds of distortions. So um, just those two main facts makes it uh, makes the bold signal changes that we're interested in um, more susceptible to being masked by sources of noise. So uh, some different sources of noise can include like obviously scanner interference or any kind of um, physiological processes like breathing or heart rate. Um, and even too like his responses to the task uh, could maybe cause some type of um, reaction as well in the bold signal. Um, so just to try to illustrate what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Um, so if, if we look at image A, that's just a picture of someone's uh, brain in resting state. And then in the slice B, it's the same slice, um, the person is performing a task. Um, and then uh, image C is the, just the numerical uh, difference between A and B. And we can see there is a difference there. Um, but even just looking at those two images, A and B, it's, it's kind of hard to tell like if they're, they're different at all. Um, but we can see, you know, just taking the numerical subtraction that they are different. Um, but looking at the uh, bold signal changes, the, the total percent changes across all volumes, you can see there's really a lot of changes happening um, in the intensity values um, uh, that are not even associated with the bold signal uh, changes. So how do we know which changes are due to the experiment and which changes are noise. Um, so Salman begins by kind of discussing some of the different approaches for estimating uh, noise and removing it. So some of, some of these are um, artifact estimation uh, techniques where they try to simulate periodic events that could cause some kind of artifacts. Um, but these kind of just depend on the availability of these measurements and the quality of the measurement. And also, too, it can be difficult to estimate some types of events like head motion. Uh, whereas with the data driven approaches, which is what this paper does, um, they're mainly based on data decomposition techniques and they make minimal to no assumptions about the relationship between the noise and the, the MR signal. And also, too, they can remove multiple types of artifacts at once. So the examples um, of some data driven approaches are ICA and PTA. And so this is just what the paper is doing. Um, so they wrote this software toolbox that combines a lot of the stuff that they're doing with um, fMRI data analysis um, into one conglomerated um, object that you can interact with. So um, it unifies those tasks. Um, and it also, he provides these um, pre-trained models that you can use with the software. 
uh, to just kind of speed up the, the, the time that you have to spend trying to classify the, the components between noise or um, network uh, connectivity components. And then um, also, too, you can just use the software as, as a standalone um, software. So uh, this is just an overview of what um, this auto label or toolbox is doing. So uh, pretty much it just takes in this testing data, uh, which is these four data sets, the FBR data set, co uh, the COBRA data set, are um, the result of the uh, GIFT software that computes the spatial maps and the time course. And then he just also just uses these um, HTTP and GSP data set spatial maps as well. And then in terms of the training data, uh, he trained two separate models. Uh, one of them he trained with the group level ICA spatial maps uh, from a previous work that he did with um, the FR data set. And also these aggregated spatial maps that were computed from the GIFT uh, toolbox. So uh, they trained this model inside of this noise cloud toolbox. And the noise cloud toolbox is this uh, software that uh, finds these uh, spatio spatiotemporal uh, features that are used to train um, this classifier, uh, which is an elastic net um, GLM. And um, then from that, uh, the classifier is used to determine whether or not one of these components is uh, part of the intrinsic connectivity network or if it's noise. And then so once, um, once we get those, um, according to this paper's approach, um, they use these anatomical atlases to assign the anatomical labels to the components. And then they use um, some different functional uh, atlases to assign the functional labels. And uh, once they have the, the functional labels of the components that are not noise, um, they can build this F and C matrix, and then they reorder it using this brain connectivity toolbox. So kind of how the training data was assembled, uh, they took this at the aggregate um, spatial maps, which are just output from the SCIF software um, from the uh, COBRA, HTTP, and GSP data sets. And then they just took the mean spatial maps and used those for one model. And then the other model, they took the total uh, spatial um, maps from the group ICA down on the FRN data set, and they just randomly sampled to get uh, 3,000 of those. So uh, this is how they describe in the paper that they went about doing this group independent component analysis. So uh, for one subject, we might just look, uh, you, you would start by looking at their fMRI file and then you plug it into this two dimensional matrix, uh, which is time by voxels. And then uh, they take this matrix and they perform a uh, principal component analysis on it. And so they transform, uh, transform all of the different uh, data objects from this old matrix into this uh, orthogonal PCA space. And then uh, they go through and do that for every subject. They get the PCA matrix uh, for each subject. And then they concatenate all of these different subjects, PCA matrices into one matrix of PCA components. And then they apply PCA one more time on that matrix, and they uh, have this other matrix of PCA components that they finally perform ICA on. And so the result is these spatially independent maps uh, where they're including noise and brain functional network components. And each component uh, includes a 3D brain map that shows the location of either the network or the artifact. So this is uh, from the paper, it's just kind of showing uh, the labeled Everburn group ICA uh, components. And this was used to train the classifier. And these colors are just corresponding to the different uh, parcellations of the functional atlases that he used in order to assign the functional label. And so this is how the noise cloud toolbox kind of works. Um, this picture is from the noise cloud um, paper. And so this is just kind of outlining how they perform their experiment, uh, but how they go about training this model is, uh, so they take in the group ICA components, from what I understand, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around this a little bit too, but um, I think they take in these group ICA components and they find these features uh, from those IC, IC independent components, and then they train this um, elastic net GLM, and that's the thing that does the classification. So uh, noise cloud is the toolbox that Salman wrote, you know, the toolbox that those people. Oh, no, no, no. Salman, Salman used noise cloud. 
and uh, to train your models. And then, but part of the software that Salman uh, wrote, you can just import this train model. So you don't have to worry about training. You can import the model that you train from Noise Cloud. Uh, noise Cloud is the GLL toolbox, the Celestic Web Channel. Yes. Some kind of MATLAB thing. Uh, or is it Python? Uh, I'm not sure if it's MATLAB. I don't, I'm not sure if it's MATLAB. It, it could be, but I, I know the, this is the person that wrote it. Her name is Vanessa Sotoka. Um, but yes, uh, so this is the thing that has the elastic GLL inside of it. And Solomon just trained this and he provides these um, weights that you can just import using the software that you don't have to train. Okay. Um, and so I, this is pretty new to me, so um, I don't exactly know uh, how this works, but from what I can gather, this GLM that's in the noise cloud toolbox, it uses uh, logistic regression with this uh, elastic net penalty. So I think it uses these two equations, A and B, to find these optimal parameters, uh, beta and beta zero, uh, that it can use in this um, logistic regression equation. And um, the uh, logistic regression function H returns a value between zero and one. And um, zero is being a noise component and one is a spatial map component. So, um, I think they thresholded these values uh, somehow using the ROC uh, values of the ROC curve. So that's how they're doing this uh, under the hood. And so this is just uh, this is like the different components that they got um, after using this noise cloud toolbox, uh, the pre trained models. So this is what it looks like. Um, the matrix A is just all of the components mixed together, uh, their noise and their network components. And then B is the noise component separated from the network components. And C is after they apply the functional label to the components. And it's the adjacency matrix uh, between the two, uh, between the different uh, functional networks in the brain. And they use this brain connectivity toolbox to just kind of uh, like reorder this matrix such that the edge weights with the highest uh, weight go towards the um, simple diagonal. And this is the Because these rates, the connectivity between, like when they're grouped by, so the upper left corner of B is C, correct? So that's yeah. between, that's, that's the anatomical. And then the upper right corner of B is between the anatomical and what was classified as noise, correct? Okay. Right. Um, and then these uh, same thing here, um, where B is just all of the different sources of um, noise and the um, connectivity components. And then uh, E is uh, finding the correlation between the noise and the um, network component for the brain. And then at this after they've applied the um, functional labels to the different um, uh, components and found the adjacency matrix and reordered it using this brain connectivity toolbox. Yeah. One question too, but like since we're talking about the connectivity as some kind of uh, quality control, uh, the classifier does it use only temporal information or spatial only or both? Do you know? Like it uses both. I'm trying to look at the most yeah, yeah. Way. Like, what are the features? The spatial map, spatial map. Um, because GLM, I'm thinking maybe it is spatial and temporal features. And if I had a feature matrix with your voice, spatial and temporal features common for each of the components. I have very good vision. That's my first observation. But yeah. so you have n components, and then you have for each of them you have two hundred forty-six features which are spatial and temporal. How do you get the spatial features? Then I wonder because you have the spatial line. Yeah. No, it looks like it's a mix of manual selected components and or like manual selected features and like automatically. Mm. Oh, this is the Soka paper. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm really not sure. Uh, mm -hmm. So something like um, what's the 
Spectral, spectral power of the they just generated a bunch of pieces like yeah yeah, yeah like, like, so they were just like the raw fishing yeah yeah like, like, like me various uh, things like that i think that was maybe the part this part right here was this feature development part i guess maybe that's how they're uh creating the input to this model mm -hmm. so. yeah likely yeah, I was a little confused about this part too. Like, what does that mean? Because it says in the paper, like, this generates 246 different features from the ICU. So I don't know. Yeah, it looks like they used a bunch of different stuff. Um, in the they give, they give like a list in the paper metrics to describe the distribution of disease score values, mm -hmm. kurtosis, humus, yeah, official okay. entropy. They do plus spread metrics, mirror likeness, uh, region issue specific activation percentages. They just like generated a bunch of features, it looks like. They, they do the same over space as we do at times, so they do for just, um, you know, high frequency energy, number of local maximum, you know, mixes and stuff. <laughs> and, um, I think we um, okay, and then, so this is just kind of visualizing some of these classified independent components. So uh, volume 13 was classified as noise, and it got these anatomical and functional labels. Uh, but then the, the other three um, in this figure are just classified as part of the network, and they got these associated um, anatomical and functional labels. And so um, it did pretty well in terms of uh, classifying whether or not uh, the components were noise or not, uh, especially for this COBRA mean uh, spatial maps and time course uh, testing uh, data. So it, it got a precision of 91.67%. Uh, and so um, that indicates that the majority of the true ICs were correctly labeled uh, for this um, testing set. Um, but that, that concludes my talk. I guess I'm done really early. Uh, but yeah, if, if anybody has any more discussion points. Do you know why 11 was, was a bit confused by why 11 was more? I have a previous one, but by 13. Oh, let, me, let me see if they mentioned it. Um, it could be temporal. Where is the left? Which one you mean? This one is going to be Or this one is? Volume 13. Yeah, it looks pretty normal. Well, there is this visual part, right? Oh, okay. It's only this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's because it's like part of the It's not just the spatial information, it's also the time. No, I know, I'm just. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> it's just like what they why it's right now, but I mean, you see it from the spatial information, which is the example they right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Functional label, but basal ganglia. Uh, yeah. It could be so close to like the the size of it. But noise network network network. So we don't discuss. Yeah, like, I'm looking. Um... Okay, I have a question. Um, I guess in the in the previous slide, you mentioned like we do uh, two ACs, yeah, and then IC. So it's like, uh, like why why did you use like the second ACs? Okay. Is it like a general method when you're dealing with this? Um, so I think. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but yeah, um, you can have all subject 
Do you have the widening uh, as well? Right, yeah. so that they need to widen the uh, So it's not on the same, like it's only output of the PC and then you put the PC on the same. I think so. Right. Wait, you're going to do different PCs or okay. you're your boss? Oh, okay. Sorry. And then you combine them and start to do like I said. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, no, I'm just curious. I guess just like for general methodology. You typically will do a single subject PC and you put PC together. Yeah, yeah it says that they. First, they do the PCA for each subject, and they then all subject data are contaminated along the time. Once you do one for the center for years. I think for everyone, that does. It doesn't have to be, I think it's more initially more of a um, <coughs> computational uh, need. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But yeah, I'm wondering if like the body versus thing, that's also like a very common idea. Oh, I think they also have. But it kind of started with. with uh, Census group I see paper 2006. So everything's about this one. Yeah. It's like it takes one paper, so I'll get inspired. Yeah. 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 But the spatial ICs are identified uh, from the reduced data using an ICA algorithm. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's like if you try to do ICA on like the full data. If, like the amount of memory you need is like super super high, and also if uh, it's it's uh, it's not widened where you have like many other issues. That's what I you know. Oh no, you have to. I see it doesn't work without PCA. Yeah. And uh, the magical answer from Apple Tovarin and that I heard is like we don't know. <laughs> he gave he gave a token and many others. It's just like it just works that way. I don't know. Like there is no exactly theoretical. Uh, why it could have, but it doesn't. Yeah. I think for a moment, I'd probably also have to use components. So the further you go, the number of components, like if you could do all the bonds, it's like it's ridiculous. Oh, uh, you mean without the reduction? Well, the problem becomes harder. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, you, you, you still, yes, yeah, sorry, but it's like if it's iteration, it's like. Well, we love Infomax because Infomax gives us. The best interpretable results uh, out of past ICA standards in formats of this conference. Right, but it's like most few iterations, right? So you can first. Informax is a stochastic uh, GD based. That's what I mean. Batch. Batch, yeah. That's what I mean. It just takes a few more long time. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, that's, that concludes my talk. I don't know. So, can I also like uh, ask you questions? I don't know. So, what basically my understanding of your talk is that this paper uh, took pre existing methods and proved or demonstrated that they work on this data still. And, or, or I thought something more than that is done, but I'm, pretty, yeah, I'm simplifying, I know, but can you correct my understanding? Well, uh, the basic three uh, contributions that they talk about. Um, is basically that they provide these pre trained models for you to use, and they just put these um, tools together in a package that you can use. Um, so you don't have to uh, go and use these things separately. So I think that's um, the main contribution, uh, which is, yeah, the, the pre trained model that they include in the software package. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I gather. I don't know. I was. At, at one point, I was wondering, like, did they write their own version of this classifier to use alongside uh, the noise cloud toolbox? But I think they just trained the, the classifier and kept the weights so you could just import it into this um, software package. Yeah, yeah it's interesting that it's a linear uh, model that works uh, well for them. No, but uh, for the context, maybe for people who don't know, um, it used to be about not so long ago, 10 years ago, maybe, uh, that you run your ICA on your own data set. And uh, other people have established that the rank of ICA should be uh, 50 or 100. Initially, it was a small rank, but then we went to higher rank. So, say 100. 
I see it's fermentation invariant or fermentation uh, and, and under specified. So you don't know which component is which. You cannot say like my first component will always be I don't know amygdala or uh, B1. You cannot uh, say you don't. but some will be. And for me, say with technical background, which kind of I don't know which one is which. They all look something, but yeah, I don't know which one to remove, which one to keep, which one of the nose. So the procedure was go to the fourth author or third author on that page. No candies, no ground here, and then so let's sit down and tell me which one that noise, and we'll remove uh, an Ishwar, spend a lot of time, thankfully. And you know, uh, so that's where it's coming from. And every time you're running an ICA, you're getting a different result. And there was a succession of tries to optimize that. I still have the code that uh, written by Ishwar that generates a report for all of your components, include like a PDF report, including the spatial map and a temporal spectrogram. And based on temporal spectrogram, it gives recommendation like this this one doesn't have a frequency components that it should have, or it's like things like that. But it's still there is a manual step after that. You make a decision which one is back. Uh, then Neuromark came where I forgot who was the author on ICA with the reference, where we 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 sort of saw the same components popping up again and again in each data set of a camera, regardless task or um, uh, resting state. But the problem was that there are still very abilities that we want to retain. We don't want to assume this will be the component, just use this component and project the data into this component space. We still want to run ICA and find those components because they are slightly variable, meaningfully variable. And that's where the difficulty comes in. Okay, we have an ICA with a reference where you at least, I don't, full disclosure, I don't know exactly how it works, but I assume that we specify the starting point and only adjust around the components. Uh, and then you know, mark this process such that alignment is preserved. The first component in this analysis is the first component in that analysis. Whatever was noise is noise. But we want more flexibility, and that's where this comes from. But I'm thinking of a deep learning classifier or something. Why not train a network instead of having crafted features, which apparently, according to this paper, still work quite well. But uh, maybe it can just tell us again. This is not you know, like just just uh, you know by looking at the spatial map sometimes things. But it's difficult, like with the components that Eloy is point pointed out. Spatial map looks okay. Why is it noise? And there are cases like that when spatial map in the case of time course is not uh, and, yeah, a lot of domain knowledge. And it's kind of again domain knowledge is uh, what we can automate with deep learning. If we have enough data in at this center, at least we have a lot of data processed. And when I heard what Salman was doing, I was actually assuming that he's training a classifier for uh, Alex Nett kind of thing. They have input, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, if, um, or maybe two or some undergrad, maybe like maybe there is still room there. Uh, maybe you can train a neural network to do the same. Like from raw some spatial maps component, but there is temporal. I think Solomon did look at mm -hmm. deep learning, but it ended up being really tough uh, to get a model that was reliable. Mm -hmm. So the exact these symbols model work so well with that you know, precision. Stuff. Yeah. Well, the feature feature set is the key. Yeah, key. Yeah, so they spend yeah. time getting the right feature. We're pretty much on the way to in general. Mm -hmm. Those are my last paper to spending like hundreds of hours checking through server updates. <laughs> it was just expensive. Don't speak for everyone. We do <laughs> with spend some hours. <laughs> <laughs> these are like all the things that get a lot of time to do it. Wow. These are like psychiatrist professors. I mean, their time is super expensive. Yeah. We're talking about like very big letters of college. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, because they were like graduate students are like the lower baseline, but everyone has to also be checked by a professor. So, like, yeah, that's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah they go check every one of them like two or three people, and then they looked at the ratings, and then they decided based on that. This is just like, you know, and that was already 
really big lab with a lot of like technology. Like I just imagine smaller labs, you know, even less effective, right? Well, oh yes, yeah. Pretty lucky. I mean, I mean, even the fact that we, you know, but this is not on. common. Uh, no, that's how we publish the paper. Well, we're not using it. Yeah, I mean, like generally the fact that we're both like thinking about the same groups and, and it's yeah. Well, yeah, we should make people use them somehow. Yeah. That means to use them. At least initial screening, so you, the professors don't spend as much right. of their valuable time. And that's what we're doing now, right? But, well, well, yeah, your yeah, market is like, everything is applauded to us, yeah. like we do here. Yeah. Well, Brain Forge is kind of like that. Yeah. But you have to, it's a lot of trust. You have to have trust in Brad, and it's not always the best way. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, it's, but that's what I mean. It's kind of funny. We're like pretty lucky, actually. Right? So yeah, we have yeah. to dive yeah. deep into like understanding what our good ideas are. We used to, yeah. <laughs> but that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And thanks, Ishwar, if you're watching this. <laughs> okay, any other any other questions, uh, discussions? People online are and uh, are usually quiet today. Uh, if you have something to add, critique, or um, uh, ask? No. Hmm. Maybe it's an early. We can finish early today then. <laughs> Thanks, CJ. I think this is just. It's a good baseline to try to beat, right? It's oh, yeah, baseline. Because it's such a simple model, it has highly engineered features, right? Well, uh, another thing to think can we do uh, can we do nonlinear ICA with uh, the class that self correct uh, that kind of knows the kind of components are good and then tries to extract them and self correct on the fly? Kind of like the yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, so I think uh, something like that. It's quite a simple gap. Yeah. So it, it does, it, it collects all the noises on the go and then gives it a uh, accuracy. I mean, it's not, I, I don't think it's been tested for brain images. I don't see that, but, uh, uh, but they, they did try it for a lot of papers, like for a lot of image uh, related data sets. And so it, and, and it uses like contrast of learning and all this. Keeps on collecting all the noises and spatially, spatially and temporarily, and then gives you the correct. So I'm not sure if that can be applied towards the look. Watch out, though, you're not just getting the same right shape for it. Yeah, exactly. Most labs with that, you always get the same right shape for it. Might as well be a template. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Uh, then uh, that will be a short uh, so Thanks everyone who's watching online. Uh, let me.